Well, good morning. At least it is morning when I'm recording here. And um, we're going to get started with part three of module 15 on the urinary system. Uh, we left off talking about renin. And renin is a very important, probably the most important hormone synthesized by the kidney. And it is synthesized in response to a drop in blood pressure. So the kidneys, of course, are monitoring blood pressure because they need to maintain a certain threshold. And when that threshold isn't reached, there's no movement through the kidney. So when it starts to drop, the kidneys are like, hey, we need to increase this artificially. It synthesizes renin. And renin um, catalyzes something that's in the body, just a natural hormone called angiotensin 2. There's, there's two different kinds of angiotensin. Technically, renin catalyzes angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 catalyzes angiotensin 2. But anyway, uh, the main worker here is angiotensin 2, a hormone which causes um, the arteries and arterioles to constrict, raising blood pressure. How does this maintain homeostasis? Well, again, it's a, um, it's a negative feedback system where something drops too low, a sensor is monitoring it, sends out a message, hey, we need to fix this, um, hits an effector, causes renin levels to increase, renin causes angiotensin to be catal catalyzed, angiotensin constricts the blood vessels or makes them smaller, causing the force of blood um, to be uh, increased causing blood pressure uh, to increase. We already mentioned erythropoietin travels to the bone marrow and stimulates the production of new bone cells or blood cells I should say. How does this maintain homeostasis? Well the same thing. Sometimes um, blood pressure uh, can be too low because of a loss of blood and um, there's simply just not enough blood moving around and uh, because of this uh, the kidneys are also monitoring um, the levels of blood, not only the pressure of blood, and can send a message, of course, and say, hey, no, I'm not having enough blood here to move through. Um, we need to increase the amount of blood, um, along with, of course, the blood pressure, and force um, the red blood cells through the kidney to get cleaned. And so uh, here's another um, illustration. In this case, it's with blood oxygen. Decreased blood oxygen. Um, there is not enough oxygen floating around to the capillaries to supply every cell in the body with what it needs. The kidney's like, let's fix this. Increase blood cell production, increase blood oxygen. And these are new cells. So the new cells, of course, typically do a better job um, than the old cells at carrying oxygen. Uh, angiotensin, particularly angiotensin 2 effects, it has four. Vasoconstriction is the most obvious one. Uh, but it has three more, which all affect an increase of blood pressure. Number two is it increases thirst. Why would it do that? Well, because water increases the blood volume, and when you have an increase in volume um, of a liquid, it's going to increase the pressure of the liquid. And number three, it increases the salt appetite you have. So if you ever start craving something really salty and, and you just can't put your finger on it, um, it could be that your blood pressure is a little low and your body, particularly your kidney, is telling your body, hey, we need some salty stuff um, to artificially raise the blood pressure because sodium uh, works with sodium channel gates in your, in your blood vessels. And those sodium channel gates... Um, pinch your blood vessels, make them smaller, increasing the blood pressure. Um, thus why someone with high blood pressure um, has to restrict their sodium intake to relax their blood vessels. And fourthly, it increases aldosterone, which increases the retention of salt by the kidneys. So typically the kidneys um, will retain a good bit of salt, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, but if your blood pressure is really low, it's going to retain every last salt particle it can. And that is in an effort to constrict your blood vessels. The pH scale. 
Now we should remember this from chemistry, the pH scale ranges from 0 to 14, with the acidic being 0, and 14 over here being the um, most basic thing. So stomach acid, stomach acid is about a 1. Tomatoes, um, pretty, um, pretty low as well. Um, I'm not sure exactly what this would be. I think it's oranges, and oranges are pretty close to being low. Um, neutral. Neutral is this um, 7 here. Pure water is a neutral 7. And blood's at about 7.4 right here. Soap. Soap's at about 11. And um, this is chlorine bleach, and chlorine bleach is one of the strongest things. Um, that is a base, and that is about 13.5. Your blood pH likes to range from 7.35 to 7.45. It's a very small range. Considering the other ranges that your body can accept, uh, think about the range of temperature that you can survive. Um, if it's 50 outside, you might not like it, but you'll survive. If it's 100 degrees outside, you might not like it, but you're going to survive. Um, but your blood pH has a very small range. Uh, acidosis is a low pH due to acid buildup. Um, you might have heard of ketoacidosis, um, which particularly diabetics have to be careful of. And alkalosis or alkaline um, is high pH due to buildup. Blood so sensitive that anything below 7 or above 7.5 is incompatible with human life. If you take the pH of blood and it's 7, the person's dead. Um, of course, we just mentioned diabetes can result in deadly changes in pH. Um, not so good. There's a couple other things that change the pH of blood. Uh, vomiting changes the pH of blood. And that's because during vomiting you lose your stomach acid. And stomach acid, of course, lowers the pH of the entire body. And so if you lose stomach acid, your blood becomes more basic. And, of course, this, the production of stomach acid um, has to increase in order to lower the pH of blood. So technically, I guess you could die from vomiting as long as you're, if, you're, if your blood couldn't get um, acidic enough again. Um, diarrhea can uh, change the pH of blood because um, of the loss of sodium bicarbonate, uh, which is produced... Um, in a couple different places in your uh, digestive line, uh, particularly uh, the pancreas. And so the sodium bicarbonate is a very basic molecule. And so if you have diarrhea, it increases uh, the acidity of blood. And kidney dysfunction permits your diet to sway your pH too much. So if your body can't clean out its blood and you eat a whole bunch of lemons, um, for instance, which are very acidic. Uh, your pH is going to drop, and your body just can't clean out those lemons fast enough to really um, to really get back to a normal pH. And so if you have kidney failure, uh, you're typically put on a very restrictive diet, and that's just because um, you can't mess with the pH of blood. And respiratory dysfunction. So if you have like a... Like a um, lung that's giving you issues or you have some sort of, um, you know, long mile to run uh, marathon, uh, CO2 levels rise, lowers the pH of blood, your body does have to respond to that. And typically if you're running, um, it responds to it very quickly and you don't really feel too uh, bad. Um, but if you do have like a collapsed lung or something, um, pH of blood does have to be monitored. And that's why a lot of times in the hospital, they take your blood so often. And my grandfather always used to joke when he was in the hospital. He said, so this place wants to kill you. They're always stealing your blood. Um, but they're not worried about your production of blood because your body produces plenty of blood. Um, they're more worried about the fact that um, your pH of blood can be far too low uh, if you have lung issues. And um, this is going to be the last slide that I'm going to talk about today. Um, it goes all the way back to bioorganic chemistry. And if you remember chapter 18 of chemistry last year, 
Uh, you probably remember Titus's blunder <laughs> on Amines. Um, and if I remember correctly, uh, we were naming some Amines and uh, we named nicotine and uh, caffeine, which are both valid Amines. And Titus said, how about heroin? Well, <laughs> that's a little bit different. Um, but there is, there's lots of different amines out there. And these amine groups, um, are made up of an NH3, um, molecule. And amino acids are the building blocks of protein. So, so really these nitrogens and these hydrogens, they're, they're not bad necessarily. Um, they're, they're very needed for proteins, especially if you um, are working out or trying to uh, bulk or something like that. Uh, you do need a lot of proteins in your diet. But if they're not needed for proteins, they're metabolized for energy broken apart and the carbon chains used to make fats. Uh, metabolism requires the removal of an amine unit. And so in order for your metabolism to run, your body to get energy, and your temperature to remain endothermic, um, you need to remove amines uh, from your um, from your body. And of course, amines are, um, in chemistry, we describe them as influential molecules. In this case, they are influential. They influence the rate of metabolism. And metabolism, of course, is a very important process in, in all mammals and it maintains our temperature, gives us energy, um, and uh, those with a very high metabolism ironically are very wasteful in their uses of their amines, thus they have to eat a lot, and those with a very low metabolism um, tend to be those who are a little bit heavier, but their body's very, um, their body's very good at using their amines. And so it's kind of ironic to say, I wish I had a higher metabolism because you'd be saying, I wish my body was less efficient. Um, but of course, metabolism does influence weight and your body, of course, designed by God um, and had to survive throughout human history where sometimes resources were very scarce. And so your body wanted to conserve as much as possible. That's why if you eat too much, your body's like, hey, let's keep this. What if we don't get the next meal? So anyway, it does that with amino acids as well. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> it does that with amino acids as well. Well, anyway, we're going to get to uh, the rest of these slides. Uh, there's not too much. We're going to get to the rest of these slides tomorrow, and we're going to talk about one of my favorite things. I guess you're going to have to find out. All right, so I will see you guys later. Um, catch you tomorrow.